oral questions. Question oral, the Honorable Leader of the Opposition. We thumb. After eight years of inflationist policies from this government, the cost of uh, the average mortgage monthly has increased by about $1,500 to north of $3,000. That's a doubling. There is a nearly equal increase when it comes to rent. Inflationist policies have increased the price of everything and increased interest rates. Will the Prime Minister finally take his responsibilities and accept that it is because of him that houses cost twice as much with their mortgage? Yes, for eight years, Canadians have put their trust in us. We have represented them as a government after three elections. And why? Because Canadians know that we are here for them. We were here for them during the pandemic. We were here and are here to bring children out of poverty through the child care benefit. We are here to help families send their kids to the dentist. Canadians trust us because they know that we are here for them. After eight years of this Prime Minister's inflationary policies driving up home prices and now interest rates, the cost of a monthly mortgage, on average, has gone up from about 1500 bucks to over $3,000. No wonder 9 in 10 young people who don't own a home believe they never will. Home price inflation is a homegrown problem. Instead of blaming the rest of the world for the problems he's caused, will the Prime Minister take responsibility for pricing our working-class youth out of a home? Yeah. The Honourable Minister for Housing. I'm very aware of the importance of keeping Canadian home ownership alive. That's why we introduced measures such as investing in a scale-up uh, rent-to-own pr uh, program in Canada, the creation of a tax-free savings account of up to $40,000 for first-time home buyers, and a two-year ban on foreign uh, ownership of re Canadian residential real estate to give more opportunities to young people. But what do all these measures share in common? The leader of the official opposition voted against them. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. We voted against every single one of the inflationary pro pro programs that have doubled the cost of housing in this country yeah, right. for our young people. They, after eight years, all they can do is brag about the hundreds of billions of dollars of other people's money they spent. What is the result? Home prices doubled to make Canada the fifth most uh, inflated housing market in the world, with Toronto having the worst city as housing markets go. The average mortgage payment has doubled from $1,500 to $3,300, and rent in Toronto, our biggest city, is up nearly 100%. Will they finally take responsibility for pricing our young people out of a home? The Honourable Minister for Tourism. Speaker, it's not a hedge against inflation that the Conservatives voted against supporting Canadians. It's their ideology that drives them. Take a look at the facts, Mr. Speaker. Canada's inflation is lower than the U.S., Germany, the U.K., the averages of the G7, the OECD, and the EU. Mr. Speaker, they voted against Canadians. Mothers who took CERB did not create inflation. Businesses that kept their businesses afloat during the pandemic did not create inflation. And parents that are taking their kids to the dentist for the first time didn't create inflation. They're peddling nonsense economics. We're delivering for Canadians. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. No, none of those Canadians created inflation. This Prime Minister created it. adding $600, $500 billion of inflationary debt, adding more debt than all other prime ministers combined. What did that do? That inflated the price of everything, especially real estate, delivered the single worst housing bubble anywhere in the world right in Toronto. Toronto was more overpriced than Singapore, than Manhattan, than London, England. Now, the cost of a mortgage has doubled across the country, and the cost of rent has doubled in our biggest markets as well. This is a homegrown problem. Will they finally take responsibility for causing it? Yeah. 
the Honourable Minister for Housing. Mr. Speaker, will the Leader of the Official Opposition take responsibility for voting against the Housing Accelerator Fund, a program to build more supply and make sure that we speed up processes to make sure we build more homes for Canadians? Will the Leader of the Opposition take responsibility for voting against the first-time tax-free savings account of up to $40,000 to enable first-time home buyers to buy a home? Will the Leader of the Official Opposition take responsibility for voting against, against, voting, voting against the foreign ban uh, on Canadian residential real estate? Whether it is on supply, whether it is on uh, supports for rental, uh, supports for Canadians, he votes against all of that. Mr. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. After eight years of growing poverty and desperation, more and more Canadians are suffering with depression. Some of them are going to food banks asking for help ending their lives, not because they're sick, but because life has become so miserable and they want to end their lives altogether. This government has suggested veterans should end their lives instead of getting help that they need. And now they've announced that a year from today, they will introduce measures to, to, to end the lives of people who are depressed. Will they recognize that we need to treat depression and give people hope for a better life rather than ending their lives? The Honourable Minister for Mental Health. Mr. Speaker, I think it is totally irresponsible for the Leader of the Opposition to misrepresent what this means. All of the assessors and providers for me are purposely trained to eliminate people that are suicidal. And so this is for... The Honourable Minister, please proceed. You have 10 seconds left. We, in this, on this side, and with the support of, of the expert panel and so many Canadians, will continue to develop and, and provide the kind of mental health supports that are necessary for people who are depressed. But the people... The Honourable Member for La Prairie. The Honourable Member for La Prairie has the floor. Mr. Speaker, yesterday the leader of the Black Quebecois met with the federal government's special representative on Islamophobia, Ms. Amira El Gawabi. Ms. El Gawabi, who has the 100% support of the Prime Minister, has made headlines since her appointment for numerous statements against Quebecers. Even the Quebec Liberal Lieutenant felt insulted. The National Assembly of Quebec has asked for her resignation. She cannot stay. Will the Prime Minister rectify? the situation finally and demand her departure. The Honourable Minister. Mr Speaker, our government's position is clear. We know that Quebecers are against all forms of racism. The Special Representative has already clarified her position and apologised for the impact of her past comments on Quebecers. I would like to invite the member to read the statements. The Honourable Member for La Prairie. Not only is Ms. Al Gawabi not the, wrong, the right person for the job, but the job itself is a problem. Wrong person for a wrong position. We all understand that the purpose of this position is to make us believe that uh, Bill 21 is evil, that Quebec is racist, and that secularism is Islamophobic. This is simply not true, and rather than building bridges, this kind of position creates barriers between communities. Will the Prime Minister back down and abolish the position of special representative to combat Islamophobia? The Honourable Minister for Housing. Uh, with the Prime Minister on Sunday in Quebec City and we saw that Quebecers from all walks of life stood shoulder to shoulder with Muslim Canadians on the somber occasion of the sixth anniversary of the Quebec City mosque shooting. The appointment of the special representative to combat Islamophobia is, the rec is a recognition and is building on the foundation of leadership of Quebecers and Canadians to fight racism and discrimination in all its forms. The special representative has clarified and apologized for the impact of her remarks, and she has shown very clearly a willingness to work with all Canadians to combat Islamophobia. Merci beaucoup. 
I would like to remind members. One, that we're in the middle of question period, and I am, I'm, I'm hearing conversations happen. It's nice that everybody's getting along and talking. <laughs> But if you've got a conversation to ta have, if you don't mind, just maybe just going into the hallway and then coming back once you've had your discussion. L'honorable. The Honourable Member for Rosemont La Petite Patrie. Mr. Speaker, the Liberals have handed over $100 million to McKinsey, and that is just the tip of the iceberg. That's not counting the millions to Deloitte, KPMG, and others. Not only is this a waste of public funds, it also undermines our very own public service. It is a form of privatization. Meanwhile, the Liberals are playing cheapskates at the bargaining table. Members of our public service deserve respect. Why do the Liberals have millions, apparently, for their friends in the boardroom, and nothing for our public service employees? The Honourable President of the Treasury Board. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Listen, the Prime Minister has given me the mandate as well as the Minister for Appropriations, uh, to study the matter, and that is what we will do. We continue to follow the most stringent openness and transparency parameters, and we will continue to support Canadians in order to make sure that there are good jobs, good services, and that is how we will continue to support Canadians. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Courtney Alberni. Mr. Speaker, Canadians deserve accountability and transparency from this government. They deserve answers on Conservatives and Liberals' long-standing partnership with expensive consulting firms with Canada as one of the best public services. McKinsey is just the tip of the iceberg. That's why New Democrats are calling to investigate firms that have been raking in hundreds of millions of dollars from the government, like Deloitte and PricewaterhouseCoopers. Will the Liberals and Conservatives both agree to stop giving piles of public money to their friends at consulting firms and support a full investigation into government outsourcing. The Honourable Member for the Public Service. And uh, as I've said repeatedly in this House, we are committed to ensuring that our con government contracts stand up to the highest standards. I will be testifying on Monday at the Government Operations Committee along with my officials, and I look forward to answering the opposition's questions more fulsomely at that time. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Edmonton, Mill Woods. Mr. Speaker, after eight years, after this Prime Minister and this government, Canadians are suffering. Mortgage payments have doubled. Rents have increased right across the country in the highest pace in the last 30 years. The cost of groceries have skyrocketed. Everything is more expensive because of this government's inflationary spending and uncontrolled spending, Mr. Speaker. Will they now admit that their economic policies over the last eight years have not worked and it's time to change course to help Canadians get through the mess that they created? Yeah. The Honourable Government House Leader. Mr. Speaker, I, I had an opportunity during the course of the other questions to reflect upon the question that was posed by the Leader of the Opposition. Uh, I would suggest uh, that the Leader think about the assertion that anybody supports anybody taking their life. Uh, that when there are difficult times, uh, and when we are talking about issues like made, Mr. Speaker, it is below this place to assume that any person anywhere in this country supports the idea of suicide as a way through dark times. The Honourable Member for Edmonton, Mill Woods. Mr. Speaker, it's the disastrous economic policy that this government for the last eight years has left people in complete despair. It has actually caused the 40-year high inflation that we, we see now and forced the Bank of Canada to raise interest rates again. Over 70% of Canadians say that they, can, that they may not be able to keep up with these aid rate increases. So now, will this government realize that their economic policies over the last eight years have been wrong? They're not working. It's time to change course and help Canadians get through the mess that they created. Here, here. Yeah. The Honourable Minister for Tourism. Mr. Speaker, Canadians know how to get through tough times. We pull together. We support each other. We don't leave people alone. The Conservative ideology is, Canadians, you're on your own. Businesses, let the markets decide. Seniors, don't worry. Go into your savings. Pay for your own rent and your own groceries. The Conservatives, Mr. Speaker, have no plan on climate change, on building the economy, on affordability. They have buzzwords and catchphrases and nonsense economics. They have no plan. We do. The Honourable Member for Peterborough, Kawartha. After eight years, 
years of this Liberal Prime Minister, people are truly struggling, and everyone knows it except these Liberals. The common question on talk shows is, what are you cutting back on due to inflation? And the answers are heartbreaking. But what's even more disturbing is that these Liberals want to blame the global market for their inability to manage your money. Yet Tiff Macklem said in just October, inflation in Canada increasingly reflects what is happening in Canada. So when will the Liberals take accountability, responsibility and fix what they've broken? Yeah. Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, it's all fine and good to cherry pick the comments of the Bank of Governor, but let's actually look at the last statement from the Governor of the Bank, who clearly said that he will pause rate increases. Are we ready now? The Honourable Minister, please continue. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Bank of Governor has been, the Bank of Canada has been clear. We expect to see inflation around 3% by the summer and closer to 2% by the end of the year. That is their mission to get inflation under control. Our job, which the Conservatives don't seem to understand because they keep voting against Canadians, is to provide supports to those who need it the most, and that's exactly what we're going to keep doing. The Honourable Member for Peterborough Kawartha. Again, we see this over and over again. They love to listen to them, in, themselves instead of real Canadians. Yeah, yeah. They love to tell Canadians they've never had it so good. Yet students are living in homeless shelters because rent in Toronto for a month is $2,500. Yes. Why? Because of this Liberal Prime Minister, a 100% increase under his, under his office. People are asking for medical assistance in dying because they can't afford to live. When will this Prime Minister fix what he has broken? And if he can't, get out of the way and let the Conservatives do the job. The Honourable Minister for Families. Mr. Speaker, what the members opposite are doing is absolutely shameful. Right. To make a mockery of people's suffering instead of supporting them when we're putting important measures on the table. Mr. Speaker, after eight years, there's one thing that Canadians have learned, and it's when they're in trouble, when they need help, they can't support, they can't count on the Conservatives. The Conservatives are not there for them. If they cared about low-income renters, they would have supported us on our support for yeah, renters. Yeah. If they cared about low-income Canadians, right. they would have supported us when we lowered uh, taxes on the middle class, and they would have supported us when we increased the Canada Child Benefit. But they did none of that, Mr. Speaker. Canadians cannot count on... The Honourable Member for Louis Saint Laurent. Mr Speaker, after eight years of Liberal governments, how is Canada doing? Inflation is the highest in 40 years. Rents have doubled. Mortgages have doubled. In Quebec, There are people who were working eight years ago in food banks. Now they go to food banks themselves. That is the daily reality of Quebecers after eight years of Liberal governments. When will the government start managing properly? The Honourable Minister for Sports. Mr Speaker, we believe that to help Canadians, we have to invest in Canadians to help them weather the storm, as we did during the pandemic and as we're doing now with the increase in inflation. That is the reason for which we're helping students, for example, by eliminating interest on their loans. That's why we have also introduced a new Canadian benefit for workers. We've created the a dental plan for under 12s. Why? Because we believe that when we invest in Canadians, the ROI is for everyone. And that's how Canada can be stronger. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Louis Laurent. Well, that's the problem, Mr. Speaker. After eight years, Canada isn't stronger. Canada is weaker. And this, despite the fact that this current government has apparently uh, has raised rather debt by five hundred billion dollars, no control in spending for the past eight years. Taxes have gone up. Everything is more expensive. That is the reality in Canada today, and that's what Canadians are confronting now. So, when will the government finally take its responsibilities and manage public finances properly? The honourable minister for heritage. Mr. Speaker, the Conservatives are saying that we have helped Canadians too much, but I would like to know uh, when we should have cut. Should have we cut uh, wage benefits? Should we have cut in our help to seniors? Should we perhaps have cut when we were helping families? 
helping those who lost their job during the pandemic. So my question is, when would they have chosen when to cut? When would they have decided to abandon Canadians? The Honourable Member for Beauport Limoilou. Mr. Speaker, Ottawa would like to welcome a minimum of 500,000 immigrants per year until the population reaches 100 million, 100 million people. These thresholds are modelled on the Century Initiative, a proposal by McKinsey, and its former director, Dominic Barton. Yesterday at committee, I asked Mr. Barton if he had analysed the impact of this increase in immigration on the future of French. He replied, and I quote, that the focus was only on the economy, not on the social outfall. Did the government copy and paste an immigration policy from McKinsey that completely ignores the future of French in Canada and in Quebec? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Mr. Speaker, perhaps I would like to talk today. It's the first time that I will be answering a question with, regarding, with regards to Francophone immigration and the importance that Quebec and Canada has on the matter. I would like to highlight this in this House because I don't know if I'll have another opportunity. For the first time, I'd like to say, for the first time in our history, we have reached the 4.4 per cent target in Francophone immigration outside of Quebec in Canada. And, Mr. Speaker, Inaudible for the interpreter, there is too much surrounding sound. The Honourable Member for Bupoli Moilou. Mr Speaker, Dominic Barton himself confirmed yesterday that the Century Initiative does not take into account the capacity for integration in French in Quebec and Francophone Canada. He states that the only focus was on productivity. So, if McKinsey did not take into account the impact of increased immigration on French, did the government do so before implementing its recommendations? Will the minister commit to disclosing all the studies on which uh, they base their decision that we could welcome a minimum of 500,000 immigrants each year without impacting Francization and French in Quebec and in Canada? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Mr. Speaker, listen. Francophone immigration has a key role to play in promoting French throughout Canada and in Quebec. Quebec, I would like to remind my colleagues, determines its own selection criteria for the vast majority of immigrants in that province, including with regards to what language they speak. We will always respect, Mr. Speaker, provincial jurisdictions, Quebec jurisdictions, and we'll continue to work with, this, with the province of Quebec. The Honourable Member for Mirabel. Mr. Speaker, so we know that McKinsey, by Dominic Barton's admission, did not take into account the impact on French before proposing a major increase in immigration. If the studies requested by the Bleu Québécois are not presented, we can assume that the federal government did not take into account either the impact on French before implementing McKinsey's recommendation. This, therefore, raises other questions. Can the government prove that it considered the impact on housing, health, or education needs, or has it decided simply to blindly trust McKinsey? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Mr. Speaker, listen. Like, like the MP across the way knows a full well, the agreement between Canada and Quebec gives the province of Quebec exclusive powers in choosing the majority of its immigrants. And we have always respect we have always respected and we will always respect Quebec's jurisdictions when it comes to immigration. And I know that our government is working hand in hand with Quebec in order to strengthen the system. And once again, I'll repeat it. We have reached our targets, Mr. Speaker. 4.4 percent of Francophone immigration outside of Quebec. The Honourable Member for Sherwood Park, Fort Saskatchewan. Well, Canadians have been suffering for eight years under this government. Well-connected insiders have never had it so good. Dominic Barton confirmed yesterday that McKinsey's Canadian lead, Andrew Pickersgill, was coordinating support from McKinsey to the Prime Minister's Growth Council. In other words, his analysts were telling the government what they needed while they were selling McKinsey as a solution at the same time. If that's not a conflict of interest, I don't know what is. So will this government end the obvious conflict of interest and finally tell this House how much money was spent on McKinsey? The Honourable Minister of Tourism. 
the minister responsible has already answered that question, but let us set the record straight in terms of who is actually standing on the side of Canadians. That is our government. What has the Conservatives done? They voted not once, not twice, but three times against tax cuts for Canadians. That side of the aisle voted against eliminating interest on apprentice and student loans. They voted against the federal minimum wage, and they voted against expanding the Canada Workers' Benefit. Who stands on the side of Canadians? We do. Canadians know one thing, Mr. Speaker, when the Open. chips are down, Canadians cannot count on Conservatives. <laughs> the Honourable Member for Sherwood Park, Fort Saskatchewan. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. We do know this government stands on the side of those Canadians who work for McKinsey, but on this side of the House, we speak for the vast majority of Canadians who are concerned about $100 million in contracts and public service doesn't know what work was done. Now, Mr. Speaker, after eight years, more Canadians than ever are suffering because of the opioid crisis, but the government continues to defend their friends. McKinsey's uh, uh, managing director, Dominic Barton, claimed to have no knowledge of the relationship with Purdue Pharma. Once again, did the Prime Minister or government ministers have any conversations with McKinsey's staff about the opioid crisis, yes or no? The Honourable Minister for Mental... Oh, the Honourable Member... Uh, Minister for Families. Mr. Speaker, after eight years, what Canadians absolutely know is that the Conservative plan when it comes to opioids is dangerous, it is reckless, and it will put people in harm's way. And what they do know as well is that when it comes to standing with Canadians, we have stood with them, whether it was when we came into office and put in important measures to lift people out of poverty, whether it was during the pandemic when we were there in their darkest hour, and now when when it comes to inflation, we put forward targeted measures that are helping Canadians every day. They know that we stand with them. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Charboul, Haute-Saint-Charles. Mr. Speaker, every government has used private sector legal or technical advice from time to time. But here we have a Liberal government that has completely lost control of its own government over the last eight years. The Prime Minister has abandoned his governance responsibilities to multinationals like McKinsey. Instead of wasting billions of dollars on these companies, the Prime Minister could have invested here at home in Made in Canada solutions. Why did the Prime Minister throw the Canadian Public Service under the bus? The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, we have an exceptional public service and we trust our civil servants so with whom we work day in, day out. We are investing in Canadians to make sure that our economy continues to grow and to make sure that programs are appropriate to, to help Canadians as much as possible. That, Mr. Speaker, all these programs are administered by our wonderful public servants. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Cowich, uh, Cowich and Malahat Langford. Mr. Speaker, Canadians are making tough choices about what they can and can't afford because grocery prices are so unbelievably high. And today, Loblaws decided to stop the price freeze they put in place under considerable public pressure. This proves that grocery CEOs can control what people pay. The government has got to take a stand against the corporate greed that is hurting Canadian families. Enough is enough. When are the Liberals going to put in place a windfall profits tax against the corporate greed and put that money back into the pockets of Canadian families that need it? The Honourable Minister for Innovation. Mr. Speaker, I'd like to say to all Canadians, we agree with the member. Enough is enough, Mr. Speaker. That's why we took action, Mr. Speaker. That's why I rolled way back to the Bureau of Competition to ask them, Mr. Speaker, to investigate, to make sure there was not any undue practices, Mr. Speaker. And I spoke to the CEOs to say to them, do what's right to help Canadians at the time of need, and we will continue to push them to lower prices for Canadians. The Honourable Member for North Island, Powell River. Well, Mr. Speaker, seniors across this country are struggling with the rising cost of living. There is a bar of Canada that sh we should all expect in Canada, and there are far too many of our parents and grandparents living below it. Yesterday, the government denied my motion to get more financial help to all seniors, regardless of age. All seniors have to pay for food, for rent, and for medication. They deserve dignity. Why does the seniors minister not agree? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. The NDP knows that older seniors are more likely to outlive their savings. They're more likely to be unable to work, be widowed, and have increased health care needs. This increase helps seniors over 75, of which, Mr. Speaker, 50% have a severe disability, 59% are women, 
40% are widows. And this fall, we doubled the GST tax credit for seniors 65 and over, which will put back an extra $225 in their pockets. Mr. Speaker, we will always provide support for seniors. We will continue to deliver for them. The Honourable Member for Yukon. Mr. Speaker, First Nations children thrive when they can stay with their families in their communities and be surrounded by their culture, an area where the Yukon has made significant progress. It has been three years since the Act respecting First Nations, Inuit and Métis children, youth and families came into force. Can the Minister of Indigenous Services inform the House how this government, working with First Nations partners, is advancing on this key priority? Good question. Well, Minister of Indigenous Services. Speaker, I want to thank the member from Yukon for his question and for reminding us that nothing is important, more important than keeping families and children together. And Mr. Speaker, on Tuesday, I joined Chief Flynn Hudson and Minister Rochelle Squires in Manitoba to sign a historic coordination agreement, Mr. Speaker, that's going to put PEGWIS in the driver's seat to determine the best way to protect children and families. Mr. Speaker, this means the next generation has a better chance. I'm so proud, Mr. Speaker, to be part of a government that understands that keeping families together is of utmost importance. The Honourable Member for Miramichi Grand Lake. Mr. Speaker, after eight years of this Prime Minister, everything feels broken in Canada, including the bail system. Violent crime has increased 32 per cent, gang-related homicides by 92 per cent, and five Canadian police officers were killed in the line of duty this year. Bail for violent repeat offenders has become a revolving door. When is this Liberal government going to take responsibility for their actions and stop this catch and release bail justice system? The Honourable Minister of Justice. Mr. Speaker, Canadians deserve to be and to feel safe. We all have a role to play in protecting our communities. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, the laws on bail are clear. If a, an accused person poses a serious risk to public safety, they should not get bail. At my direction, Mr. Speaker, from the month of October past, federal officials have been working with their provincial and territorial counterparts to develop ways to best keep Canadians safe. We are open to that discussion, Mr. Speaker. We're open to participating with the provinces to help in the enforcement of bail conditions. Hamilton. Mr. Speaker, we're looking for lasting solutions. Hamilton. The Honourable Member for Miramichi Grand Lake. Well, Mr. Speaker, I'll ask that minister to tell the victims of those five police officers what he just told me. Most Canadians do not live in homes surrounded by walls and gates and don't have the security detail of the Prime Minister. That is a luxury that Canadians do not have. With a 26 per cent increase in New Brunswick crime over the past five years, Rural Canadians are also negatively impacted. These failed soft on crime liberal bail policies are making Canadians feel less safe. When will the Prime Minister put victims ahead of criminals? Yeah, 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 yeah. The Honourable Minister of Justice. Mr. Speaker, I, I take offence to the idea that any of us are less empathetic towards victims, particularly in, in, these very, in these very cases. Mr. Speaker, our heart goes out to those victims. Mr. Speaker, with respect to the bail system, I have been working with my officials, with officials across Canada, provincial and territorial counterparts, precisely to, to see where we can improve the bail regime, Mr. Speaker. We know that Canadians need to feel safe, and we are moving forward in a positive direction, appreciating that it is a complex issue, that, that it is a, a, a shared area of responsibility with the provinces, and with the provinces, we will find a solution. The Honourable Member for Fundy Royal. Well, Mr. Speaker, Canadians take offence to a government that will not listen to the pleas from all 13 premiers right. that have seen violent crime go up by 32 per cent in the last eight years. Out of 44 shooting homicides in Toronto, Mr. Speaker, last year, oh, half of them were committed by someone who is out on bail. In a single year in Vancouver, 40 people arrested 6,000 times. Wow. After eight years, this Prime Minister Career criminals have never had a better friend. Does this Justice Minister honestly stand by his claims that our broken bail system is working? The Honourable Minister. Cherry-picking statistics and, and taking high-profile cases and using them for political purposes does not help us to attack the challenges that the bail system uh, presents to us. Mr. Speaker, as I've said, we have been working on that, on that question. 
uh, since the month of October with our provincial counterparts. We are looking at solutions that can be fixed in the law, but we're also looking at the, the kinds of things that the provinces can do in the administration of the bail system. British Columbia has taken a leadership role, Mr. Speaker. I met with the Attorney General for British Columbia yesterday to go over what BC was doing. Ontario is interested, and so are other provinces. We'll work together. The Honourable Member for Fundy Royal. Canadians don't need victim blaming. Right. They need leadership and action. Uh, which stats would the, uh, would the Honourable Minister wish that we weren't cherry picking? Violent crime is up 32 percent. Gang related homicides have increased by 92 percent. 44 shooting related homicides in Toronto, half of the accused were out on bail. 40 offenders arrested 6,000 times. Right. If the minister has some stats he'd like to share, we welcome them. Until then, we need to get our heads out of the sand, take action, listen to the police, listen to communities, listen to the premiers, and reform this liberal failed bail system. The Honourable Minister of Justice. I said earlier today in the House of Commons, statistics from Toronto, uh, from Toronto Police over the past two years show that that bail, that offences created, uh, committed while out on bail, have gone down over the past two years. Mr. Speaker, we we appreciate that Canadians need to feel safe, and Canadians have a right to feel safe. Mr. Speaker. Okay, please continue. Mr. Speaker, Bill C-75 codified what were essentially Supreme Court decisions and made it harder to get bail in a number of cases and did not change any of the severity of bail conditions for violent criminals. Mr. Speaker, yet we're still going to look at other possibilities with the provinces in order to move forward to make Canadians feel safe. The Honourable Member for Avignon, la Métis Matane, Matapédia. Mr. Speaker, in Montreal, 73 percent more people are receiving welfare today compared to last year, not because of, of a lack of jobs, but because of Roxham Road. The federal government is inviting asylum seekers to take Roxham Road, and once they're here, it can't issue them a work permit for up to a year. The federal government is ensuring that these people end up in poverty, and they have to turn to welfare, and it's costing Quebecers $20 million more every month. Will the government pick up the check? The federal government? After all, it's the one responsible. The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of Immigration. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Well, Quebec is a valuable partner for the federal government, and we understand that the province is engaging in very hard work to support asylum seekers. Our government is offering support totaling 100 and $134.5 million in support to provinces, as well as a great deal of support to Quebec in order to help the provinces deal with support to asylum seekers. We have also invested to ensure that there is medical coverage for essential medical care for asylum seekers, and we will continue to collaborate with our partners. The Honourable Member for Longueuil Saint-Hubert. Well, Mr. Speaker, the Liberals love to tell us what to do, and yet they are pushing asylum seekers towards welfare. And that's not it. There's also a housing shortage, in great part because of underfunding from the federal government. So dozens of asylum seekers are homeless and are turning towards overloaded community organizations and shelters. There are people who will end up in the street because we're not giving them resources. Where, do, where can these people go? Nowhere. Why not suspend the safe third country agreement, spread out asylum seekers throughout the country, and welcome these people with the dignity they deserve? The Honourable Minister of Heritage. Mr. Speaker. The Bloc Québécois is actually, when it comes to telling people what to do, is the international world champion. Now, had my colleague consulted the documents, he would have seen that between 2017 and 2020, the government of Canada contributed $374 million for Roxham Road. And for 2021-22, Quebec has sent us uh, the bill, and we're going to sit down and talk about it. We're also paying for health care for asylum seekers. 
We are there for Quebec. The Bloc Québécois doesn't like it, but we deliver. Well, member for Kildonan St. Paul. Mr. Speaker, today the Justice Minister said if someone poses a significant threat to public safety, the law tells us they should not get bail. But in reality, Mr. Speaker, in Toronto last year, of the 44 gun murders, 24 of the suspects were out on bail Sorry. when they committed these murders. Those 24 people clearly posed a, a threat to public safety, and yet they were out on bail. So when will this minister get his head out of the clouds and commit to reforming our broken liberal bail system that he helped create, Mr. Speaker? Okay. The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, it's, it's a fundamental principle that if a person poses a threat to public security, they should not get bail. Mr. Speaker, that's balanced. That is balanced with the fact, Mr. Speaker, that bail is not only a charter right, but it is a common law right of long date because in our system one is innocent until proven guilty. Mr. Speaker, we, we allow judges uh, to make that determination based on the arguments that, that prosecutors and, and defense attorneys put before them. So I won't revisit an individual case. But what I can say, Mr. Speaker, is that we are working with our provincial counterparts to see how we can improve the bail system in order to make Canadians feel more safe. The Honourable Member for Shikurimi Lefeur. Mr. Speaker, violent crime in Canada has increased by 32 percent since 2015 and gang-related murders by 92 percent. And the Liberals, supported by the Bloc Québécois, passed C-5 legislation to remove minimum sentences. That's what Canada looks like after eight years of this government. More crime and more criminals in the street. Can the minister acknowledge reality and admit that his policies favor criminals and penalize victims? The Honourable Minister of Justice. Mr. Speaker, as I just said in English, the bail system is extremely important in our system. If someone poses a threat to public safety, they should not be freed on bail. There is a balance to be struck here, Mr. Speaker. We will work with the provinces because clearly the federal government is responsible for the criminal law, but we need to focus with the province's collaboration on how to administer the system. That's what we will do together. The Honourable Member for Chicoutimi de Fior. Mr. Speaker, serious crimes should have serious consequences. That was the motto when the Conservatives were in power. But now, there is no more mandatory minimum sentence for rapists. For example, Jonathan Gravel, a man convicted of rape, will serve his sentence from the comfort of his home. A Crown prosecutor in Quebec was brave enough to criticize this unacceptable situation. Has the minister forgotten the word justice in his title? Because there is no justice here for victims. The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, we firmly believe that all victims of sexual assault deserve a justice system that treats them with dignity and respect. I would like to recognize the resilience of the victim in question. Mr. Speaker, as I have said several times, serious crimes deserve serious consequences. My colleague knows this, Mr. Speaker, but I can't comment on a particular case, but I can say that it was a decision of the Quebec courts. And the decision to appeal the case remains outstanding. The Honourable Member for Saint-Léonard-Saint-Michel. Mr. Speaker, the Minister of Justice just announced a one-year extension before allowing medical assistance in dying for people with a mental illness as only medical condition. We know that medical assistance in dying is a complex subject and it's very personal for many Canadians. Can the minister explain to us the reasons for his decision? The Honourable Minister of Justice. I'd like to say grazie to my colleague for Saint-Léonard for her question and leadership. This is a complex issue. That is why we have listened to experts, members of the medical community, and concerned citizens who were asking for more time for clear standards to be developed. Canada has developed legislation on medical assistance in dying in order to support autonomy and freedom of choice while protecting the most vulnerable. We will continue to go in that direction. 
and we will do things right. The Honourable Member for Simcoe North. Mr. Speaker, after eight years of fiscal mismanagement, this Liberal government isn't even hiding it anymore. They've now decided they no longer need to accept the advice of the Auditor General, who says $27 billion of COVID support payments need to be investigated. Instead, the CRA says it's not worth the effort. So will the government take the advice of the independent Auditor General or do they believe it's not worth the effort to recover money for taxpayers? Very good question. Critical Parliamentary Secretary. The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Mr. Speaker, when the pandemic hit, we acted quickly to get recovery benefits into people's bank accounts without delay. Right. To achieve that goal, we plan to verify eligibility in the back end after the fact. This approach kept workers attached to their jobs and positioned our economy to come roaring back. The report found that our individual support programs achieved their intended goals of getting money to Canadians quickly, allowing Canadians to stay home safely, avoiding severe social and economic consequences. Sure this AG also noted that lower income workers and groups most impacted by the pandemic were able to benefit from the pro programs. Mr. Speaker, we are proud of the measures we took to support Canadians. That's right. <laughs> The Honourable Member for Essex. Mr. Speaker, the words costly coalition has been given new meaning. Last week we heard that the head of the CRA said it wouldn't be worth the effort to fully review $15.5 billion in what might be incorrect pandemic wage benefits. Wow. After eight years of this Prime Minister, Canadians are using food banks more than ever and finding it impossible to buy a home. Mr. Speaker, does this Liberal government think it isn't worth the effort to fully review payments with a total of $32.2 billion of Canadian tax dollars? Good question. The Parliamentary Secretary. Thank you very much for the question, Mr. Speaker. It's unfortunate. It turns out the member opposite was not attending last week's meeting of the Public Accounts Committee, because if he was, he would have heard the Commissioner of the CRA say that verification work is ongoing with respect to CERB, That's with right. respect to CUES, with respect to all of the emergency programs that this government turned out to help Canadians, individuals, families and businesses. It's a fiscally responsible approach that we promised throughout. In fact, you should go back to the record, in November of 2020, it was that party, the Conservatives, that voted against carrying out CRA audits on businesses. Thank you very much. The Honourable Member. Gray Owen Sound. Mr. Speaker, Abdul Hamdard is in Ottawa this week and here today pleading with the Liberal government to get his family out of Afghanistan. Abdul has served alongside our troops in Afghanistan and his family qualified to come to Canada almost a year ago, but nothing has happened. His brother is now missing, feared dead, and his family is living under daily threats. He personally met the minister on Tuesday. How many more Afghans that have helped Canada need to die before the minister commits to urgently getting Abdullah's family and other Afghans safely to Canada? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of Immigration. Mr. Speaker, I have to say if it was a matter of will, there would be 40,000 Afghan refugees here already. There is obstacles that are beyond certain control. As the member just said, the minister did meet. But let me remind this House about the last, the last number we have. We have here, so far, agree and, and welcome 26,700 Afghan that can now call Canada home. Mr. Speaker, we will continue to work with our Afghan community. Merci. The Honourable Member for Vaughan Woodbridge. Afternoon, Mr. Speaker. Like many employers, last year the federal government experimented with new hybrid approaches to work. Now it has begun phasing in a new common hybrid work model across government. Can the President of the Treasury Board please explain how this model will, will help the government serve Canadians? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. President of the Treasury Board. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I want to thank my honourable colleague for not only his question, but his hard work for the people of Vaughan Woodbridge. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, Canada's public service is one of the best in the world. Hybrid work lets us harness the best of in-person and remote work, creating shared in-person experiences that foster collaboration and trust, together with the flexibility of up to two to three days of remote work a week. Consistency in how hybrid is applied across government will make employees' experiences consistent 
no matter what, where they work, and it will support our core purpose, serving Canadians. Thank you. The Honourable Member for London Fanshawe. Today I presented a petition from over 33,000 Canadians wow. calling on the Prime Minister to defend public health care. Canadians know that when Conservatives say innovation, they mean privatization, which means lining the pockets of corporations and sticking patients with the bill. And the Prime Minister knows it too. Last election, he called out the Conservatives' support of health care privatization, promising he would defend our public system. But today, he will not keep that promise. Will the Prime Minister tell us if he meant what he said during the last election, or if this is another Liberal flip-flop? Yeah. The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of Health. Mr. Speaker, let me be clear. Canadians are proud of our system, and this government is too. It is based on need and not the ability to pay. And we believe that all you should need in order to get health care, Mr. Speaker, is your health card, not your credit card. We will make sure that our investments respect the Canada Health Act while always defending our universal public health care system. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Richmond, Athabasca. Mr. Speaker, in my writing, there are organizations that welcome artists, athletes, and international students year after year. And they, of course, need a visa. But the problem is that the processing times are now more than 18 months. That's 14 months more than in July 2022, even though the standard is supposed to be 14 days. In August, the minister said that a high would be reached in September and that after that, processing times would go back to normal. But now we're in February and things are getting worse and worse. How can the minister explain this total failure for people who are trying to get a visa? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of Immigration. Mr. Speaker, we are doing everything we can to address this situation in the immigration system in order to make it more sustainable. We processed around 4.8 million requests in total, t double what we did the previous year, and we came back to the 60-day service standard for, for educational permit requests. And so we are allowing more people to come into the country, and we are delivering and hiring more workers. Thank you. Tout le temps que nous avons. That's all the time we have for question period today. It being 3.10, pursuant to order made on Thursday, June 23rd, 2020.